This is obviously The Last of Us 2, and um, I just want to start right at the beginning and say there's going to be tons of spoilers in this video. So if you didn't notice on the thumbnail, if you didn't notice on the title, uh, there are spoilers. I'm going to delay talking about the spoilers for just a little bit so you have time to get out of here no matter what circumstances you're under. But uh, yeah, after I'm done talking about sort of the production values and the gameplay of this game, uh, I'm going to be talking about the story. So get out now if you haven't played it yet. It's some of the best, most sort of um, surprising and challenging storytelling I've ever seen in a video game. You should experience it as fresh as you possibly can. That said, uh, this is one of my favorite games of all time. I absolutely love what The Last of Us 2 uh, is doing. And um, let's just start with the insane production values. I mean, look at the way this game looks. I mean, these characters, the way that they animate, the way that they just feel so natural and normal. This is a quadruped with two bipeds riding on it, clinging to each other. And they just look like real people. This environment is just lush and in motion constantly and everything about it feels so real these are places this is my actual stomping grounds i work near here um this is th this route that they take around seattle is basically my walking in bus route to the office and it just it really feels like i'm in my own stomping grounds it's crazy um and so it's interesting um normally i don't do reviews or criticisms of uh, games. I'll do, you know, let's plays. I'll do playthroughs, but I don't really get into a lot of depth talking about a game the way that a critic would. And part of that is because I'm not a critic. I'm a game developer. And so I've got a different perspective than they have. And uh, yeah, that's not really what you come here for. Also, you know, when I am, uh, you know, playing other people's games on this stream, I try to be as positive as I possibly can because as a game developer, I've got a lot of sympathy for other game developers. And when things don't go quite right in a game, it's tough to have other people just sort of rubbing your face in it all the time. So I always try to be extremely positive on my channel. I, I'm not really here to, you know, to rip on other games or dunk on other games. Because uh, I know, I mean, the game that I work on, State of Decay 2, has got plenty of its own problems. The last thing that I want is to have other game developers coming in and ripping on my work. Why would I rip on somebody else's? Um, the reason I feel safe to sort of have a little bit more of an in-depth discussion of The Last of Us 2 is because I love everything about it. <laughs> and so th there's no risk of me saying anything negative about it that would make anyone at nod dog feel bad this game is a triumph um and so it's interesting to talk about the production values of this game because you know the difference between the last of us 2 and pretty much every other game on the market with very few exceptions it, it, it's like uh, it's just like an order of magnitude they're just in a different league from everyone else with with the sheer production values that they can uh put into it and i just want to talk a little bit about what makes it possible to have production values as high, because it's expensive. You you know, it, it's not just a question of whether or not you have talented people working at your company. You know, uh, e every game developer I know has talented people working at their company. That's not what makes a difference between The Last of Us 2 and, and another random video game with, with lower production values. Um, usually it has to do with the amount of money and time you can spend on the project. And that, uh, because, because all, if you think about it economically, because all video games are required to cost the same amount or lower. Like, 60 bucks is the ceiling. We can't go any higher than that. Um, uh, for magical reasons that no one can explain. Uh, and so, when you make a game that is more expensive, like The Last of Us 2, or like other games in its league... Um, you can't just charge more for the game and pay for it that way. Uh, you have to have, uh, basically, either you have to know in advance that your game is going to sell a ridiculous number of copies, uh, because basically, because that, you know, volume, especially in the digital era where you don't have manufacturing costs, uh, you know, sort of, but like, you don't have to make, uh, you know, like millions of discs in order to sell millions of copies, um, you know, just sheer volume can justify uh, the expense of, of, of your team for that amount of time. Uh, and so that's, you know, that, that's one way to do it. If you know that you are a, a, known, uh, a known quantity and that you're going to sell a certain number of copies, you can devote tons of resources to a game. That's, that's how Rockstar works with, uh, with, with Grand Theft Auto. You know, they can pour more resources into that game than anyone else because they know when their game comes out, literally everyone is going to buy it. So, you know, so it's okay. They can spend the time. The other thing, you know, if you are, um, if you're supported by a larger company that doesn't need to turn a profit on your game, like say you are owned by the maker of a console and what they want is 
an exclusive game that makes their console stand out above other games. If you've got that going for you, then you can, you know, feel free to devote tons of resources to upping the production values of your game because there's just, you know, because even if the game doesn't turn a profit, it's still it, the fact that it's unique, uh, the fact that it, you know, that it sells hardware is enough to justify the cost, uh, even if the game itself doesn't turn a profit. Now, in this case, I'm pretty sure the game did turn a profit on its own and didn't need to rely on that. But because this is a PlayStation exclusive, even if it didn't turn a profit, it's still a valuable thing for Sony to have invested uh, in. And I don't really know. Don't quote me on any of the economic assumptions I'm making here, because I don't even know how the relationship between Naughty Dog and Sony or anything works. So, you know, I'm, I'm not an insider on that side. Uh, another option is to limit yourself in other ways. You know, people like uh, like um, Ninja Theory, for instance. You know, they made uh, 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 Hellblade, Send You a Sacrifice. And that game had easily production values that match this game. But that game was very short and very simple. And they basically, you know, made it so that the, the production values and the, you know, the, the acting, the performance of the characters, the character model... Everything about it that just made it so unique and 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 and, and sort of stand up head and shoulders above the crowd. That's the only thing they put their money into, and they didn't put you know a ton. They they deliberately made it a simple game so that they could fo you know focus all of their effort on on the things that they wanted to stand out about it. So The Last of Us Two is kind of in this special sweet spot where they don't have to make those sacrifices because they know everyone loves this franchise and everyone trusts Naughty Dog, and that they're going to sell a ton of copies. And they know that as a console exclusive, they're, they've, they've just got a lot of security. Um, so, so it's interesting to see that, you know, so I have tons of respect for all of the talent that went into this. I mean, there are some fantastic people at Naughty Dog doing a lot of their best work. And I, I feel like, you know, we as, uh, as, you know, players of games are lucky that that they live under circumstances, uh, you know, that, that, that their, their franchise exists under circumstances that allows them to do this work, to spend the time to work this out. Because, you know, I, I've been listening to interviews by, with Neil Druckmann and stuff about, you know, the, all the different ideas they pursued in this game, um, the, the, the changes they made during development, uh, the ideas that they pursued and then canceled. And there was a fair amount of them. This game did not look the way it looks now throughout development. They had to throw stuff out. They had to make big changes. And a lot of the time, a game developer doesn't have that freedom. You know, whatever you put down first, that's what you have to ship because you don't have time to redo it. Um, and so the fact that they're so good at what they do and the fact that they, you know, basically have the economic freedom to devote the time and effort to make to perfect something like this, it, it's a, you know, really a boon to all of us. So that I super, super appreciate. Um, <laughs> anyway, so... That's the production values. Uh, I could talk about the gameplay, except that it I don't know. I feel like the story is really what deserves the most time when we're talking about The Last of Us 2, because that's really what these games are about. The gameplay is really good. It's top-notch. I mean, it feels really good to play. I really enjoy it. The, the, you know, the, the, the stealth, the cleverness uh, that you have to exhibit is, is, is a lot of fun. But it's all there to kind of to serve the purposes of, this, of the, uh, the purposes of the story. Like, you know, say the crafting system, for instance. The key thing that I remember, that I note about this crafting system is that it doesn't allow you to stock up. You can only carry as much as you can really carry in your backpack. You know, extremely limited resources. Like, you can only carry three of each thing. And so, and every time you craft one thing, it costs two resources out of your backpack. And it's very limited. You can't just pile as much as you want to into that thing. And so uh, so you always end up feeling like you're always improvising. You're always desperate. You're always running low on something. Uh, and you never have enough. And that feeds into the feeling of sort of desperation and uh, deprivation in the characters. The fact that they feel alone and, and they're only, they can only live by their own wits. That feeds into a lot of these sort of emotional themes that are going on in the story. Uh, the fact that, you know, that Ellie is on this quest because she has no recourse. She, she you know... People have to take justice into their own hands in a world like this because no one is there to save them. And and the mechanics of the game where you always feel like you're deprived, you always feel like you don't have enough, feed into, into those emotions. And so you can feel kind of how the characters feel because of the way the game mechanics are operating with you. Similarly, um, the combat system, the fact that, you know, this game does not have any cannon fodder enemies. There's no one who cannot completely screw you up if you let them get close, uh, or if you give them a, a, a free shot at you. There aren't, you know, you're not mowing down hordes of zombies or something like that. Each zombie, if they get up in your face, they can kill you. They can murder you. 
Um, which is great because it means that, you know, each time you kill something, it's a big accomplishment. It's not just like, oh yeah, I mowed down hundreds of these things and it didn't matter. You do kill hundreds of enemies in this game, but each one you do one at a time, carefully, and it matters. And that's really important because this game is, you know, the story of this game is a lot about the impact of killing and, and you know, making it matter. And, and so they needed to have a combat system that makes each kill matter. That mean, that means that you you really focused on it and you really care about it. You know, I've heard a lot of people criticize the extreme violence in this game, which I sympathize with. I understand, like watching someone cut someone else's throat. Like I have a very like I'm almost phobic about protecting my neck, and so watching her slit the number of throats that she slits in this game is horrifying for me. Very difficult for me to deal with. And there there are some of the deaths in this game. Like there's one involving a shotgun to the face that. Every time I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. You know, the reason why they lean into all of this violence is because we live in a world full of action movies and games where mowing down crowds is normal. It's just we're all used to it. We're all really desensitized to it. And for a game that's trying to tell a story about the impact of violence and the impact of killing and, you know, all of the consequences of taking a life, if the game wants to be about that, it has to make each killing, each instance of killing, feel like it matters. And when we're already so desensitized, like I, I honestly don't see a great way for them to do that without leaning into the hardcore realistic violence. And as unpleasant as it is, and it's really unpleasant for me a lot of the time to see it happen, um, especially like seeing a throat ripped out. Gah! Um, I understand why they do it, you know, and I feel like it actually it's serving a need in the story and it's something that I appreciate. And that's actually a big part of my experience with the Last of Us franchise altogether is that they often do things that make me unhappy and make me uncomfortable. But then as I think about it, I'm grateful that they made that choice because it's a unique experience I couldn't possibly have anywhere else. Um, and so that, and that kind of brings us to a discussion of the story. So this is where the hardcore spoilers are going to come in. So I tried to warn you at the beginning of the video. Now I'm really warning you. The spoilers are going to come hard and heavy here. So if you haven't stopped it yet, you should stop it. Um, so, yeah, by the way, I'm sorry that I'm not reading uh, very much of the chat right now. I'll get to that at the very end. Uh, but I kind of want I've got sort of a list of ideas in my head that I really want to try to get out. Uh, so I appreciate your patience. Um, so the story direction. I love it. I love everything about it. And uh, I didn't understand the hardcore negative reaction that some people had to it at first. Um, I think that I, I've put some thought into it. And I think I can kind of understand where some folks are coming from. But for me, this is exactly what I wanted. And so let's let's talk a little bit about what happens. Just, you know, to get the spoilers out of the way, obviously the inciting incident of this story is the death of Joel, who was the main prota protagonist of the first game. And uh, that was a controversial decision. But for me, it totally worked and made sense because the Last of Us One was Joel's story, and it covers you know fifteen years of his life, and it's about him and how he changes from you know the inciting incident with the death of his daughter, through you know basically being um, just really anti everyone, <laughs> you know being a really sort of uh, uh, just a broken, messed up person, just kind of doing what it takes to survive, but not living for anything, being won over by this little girl. That, that he, um, well, not little girl, teenage girl, that he has, you know, that he becomes a protector for and sort of a surrogate father for. And you feel like he's changing in this really important way. And then at the very end, because he's become so obsessed with her, he takes this really horrific, dark turn and really kind of shows that, no, he is still a broken, messed up guy. And the fact that he's, you know, turned this, instead of turning it, yeah, you know, these, these sort of dark impulses he has and this this violent streak that he has. Instead of using it purely in selfish ways, he's using it to protect this girl. That doesn't really make it better. He still does something horrific. And her ignorance about it at the end, the fact that he lies to her and tells her that he didn't do the things that he did, it's a dark ending. It's It's a really kind of disturbing ending. But that is the story of this guy's life. And... I feel like it actually wrapped up his story in a satisfying way where I'm not satisfied in the sense of approving of his choices or, you know, approving of his character and thinking that, you know, that he's noble and good hero. But it was satisfying in the sense that it, it really sort of, I don't know, it said something. And it said something that I, that I haven't seen a lot of other stories say. And so so I really appreciated that. And But I felt like it was over. You know, I, did, I felt like continuing to belabor Joel's story 
you know, throughout a, a sequel would have felt tacked on. It would have felt unnecessary. It would have felt like, oh, just more of the same. It felt like, to some degree, we would have to undo a lot of the work that The Last of Us did in order to, to tell another story with the same character. And so I really like the fact that basically that what they did was they made a game that was largely about Joel, but it's after his death, the ramifications of the choices that he made. Like this entire game, The Last of Us 2 is haunted by Joel. Joel is there at the beginning. He is there throughout and he's there at the end. Even though he's not physically your protagonist, everything that's going on is because of Joel and because of that choice that he made at the end of The Last of Us. Um, and so he, he is the central character of this. He's not the protagonist. He's not the character you play. But he is absolutely a central force in the story. And so we didn't really lose Joel. What we did was we closed off his arc, and now we're seeing the arcs of other people living in the world that Joel created. Um, and what kind of, you know, and what kind of world did Joel create? He created a cycle of violence, uh, a horrific cycle of violence that sort of continues on. Um, so that brings us to Abby. <laughs> Abby is an amazing character. She's one of my favorite characters in all of video games. Um, and, and she was absolutely, you know, a lot of people have resentful feelings towards her, but I feel like she was absolutely necessary to express the theme to this story because, you know, uh, like the moment when Joel shot her father in The Last of Us was, was a really horrific moment for me. Like I was, you know, in that moment, I tried to shoot that doctor in the leg when I was playing The Last of Us 1 and it still acted like I had shot him in the neck or in the face or something like that. It was, you know, I was like, I'm tr like... I don't want to kill the doctor. I want to save Ellie. Sure. I don't, I, I at least want Ellie to wake up and make a choice about her own fate. That would be great. I don't want to murder the doctor who might be the last hope of humankind. That doesn't seem right. Um, and so when Joel made that choice, I actually really reacted viscerally negatively to that. I did not want to be enacting that choice with Joel. It did not work for me. And I felt really uncomfortable about it. Um, and so for me, having Abby as one of the protagonists of this game and having her come in and get revenge on Joel as, as the first act of this was immensely satisfying to me because basically this entire game, this entire sequel is about the feeling I had in that moment where I hated killing that doctor. And it's, it's taking that feeling that I had at the end of the last of this one and making an entire game about why I felt that way. What was so horrific about this choice that, that Joel was making. Um, because, you know, because Joel was basically like, he was taking on this attitude where it's like, it's me and Ellie against the world. Anything I have to do to rescue Ellie is justified. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter who dies. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. All that matters is me and my people. And my people consist of two people, me and Ellie. And that's all that exists in the entire world. And nothing else is real. No one else has any humanity. And he was willing to do anything to save her. And some people find that inspiring and, and, and exciting. For me, that is a very dangerous mindset that I, uh, that I viscerally react negatively to. Um, you have to imagine other people complexly. You have to think about other people as being real and having humanity. Um, and so when I, you know, and so for me, seeing the, you know, having this, this game be about the consequences of those actions, having someone who loved that doctor, who relied on that doctor, it was her father, seeing her taken down a dark path by this and, and becoming obsessed with revenge and justice, uh, you know, for her dad and, you know, and having her basically do to Joel what Joel did to her father. I mean, it makes sense. It feels justified to me. It feels absolutely, you know, right that that's what would happen. That Joel, when he killed that doctor, should have expected that people would be angry and people would want revenge. And basically, as long as he got to save Ellie, I think he didn't even care that much if there were consequences for him. Um, and so for me, it just, you know, and, and so there's that part of it where it feels justified. But then the story of Abby, when you actually take over Abby halfway through the story and you control her and you see her go on an arc that is like Joel's arc in the original, but even better. Like she actually, she starts in this place where she, you know, wants to get revenge and she's consumed with hate and she was willing to do anything and she has a reputation for you know other people among the wolves are disturbed by her attitude and her actions and she goes from there to actually you know really valuing the life of someone who she would normally think of as as, as a faceless enemy you know and she d basically turns against everything she stood for she turns against her own people she, just to protect someone 
that she has come to care about, somebody who she normally would have just dismissed as a scar. You know, call, call them a slur and, and treat them like an animal. She really comes around to imagining other people in that complex way, or understanding their humanity as being equivalent to hers. And she, multiple times, refuses to take revenge. You know, even though she took revenge that one time on Joel for, you know, destroying the mission of the Fireflies, killing her father, killing lots of people that she knew, she took revenge on him, but then she stopped and she would not go any further. And when she had the opportunity to kill Ellie two times, she didn't kill Ellie. Maybe even three times, she didn't kill Ellie. Um, and she really, you know, I mean, she has a lot to atone for. She's done a lot of bad things, but she turns it around. And she made the, she made the transformation that Joel couldn't make. But... So we see someone do that. We see someone make a better choice than Joel in the wake of, of Joel's, you know, horrific decisions. But then we see, but we don't see it yet. We start hating her. We, you know, we start out not knowing her justification, knowing that all she did was kill Joel. Um, and then we, we follow, you know, Ellie going after the wolves, seeing the wolves as being scary villains, you know, people who have done a lot of bad things. We see, we read letters from a lot of their victims, people who are disturbed by the way that they behave. And, you know, we see all of this stuff and we're really sort of geared up to see Abby as this terrifying, uh, you know, villain, a, a, a monster we have to destroy. And then, you know, we, we finally encounter her. She has summarily killed a character we've come to love, you know, uh, in, in uh, uh, Jesse, I think was his name. Um, you know, I played an entire half of a game without him, so it's easy to forget. Um, but, and then we drop into her perspective. And so we've, you know, built her up as being the villain, and then we get to watch her, you know, have friends. We get to watch her feel ashamed of her actions, feel embarrassed in front of her friends about how bad things got with her. We get to see her look at an enemy and start to understand their humanity. We get to see her transform and change and see that, oh, she's not just this one act that we might hate her for. She's much more than that. She did this one thing that maybe we think, you know, she took that too far. As much as, like, I also think it's kind of justified for her to have, you know, killed this one person who killed so many people and did so much damage. Maybe it's actually kind of okay that she wanted to do that. But even if we, you know, disapprove of, of the capital punishment generally and are like, no, she should not have killed Joel, we start to see, you know, that she is more than just killing Joel. She's a lot more than that. And over the course of the second half of the game, we get to realize she is on a redemption arc. And we want her to succeed at that redemption arc. We want her to get away with Lev. And we want her to survive and thrive and, and move on from this dark past that she has to, to do something better with her life and improve the world and meet up with the Fireflies and Catalina and do all this great stuff. And then we go back to Ellie and we're trying to hunt her down. And now it's got this whole other context where, you know, just like Joel killing that doctor, that doctor saved a zebra. You know, that doctor is making a hard choice, but with a lot of good motivations. And, you know, it's like, it puts into context this idea that, you know, taking revenge on people, going after them with a single-minded sense of, you know, they are inhuman, they're a monster, I'm going to destroy them to get what I want. I'm gonna, my people are the only people that are real. Everyone else is a monster, I have to destroy them. And it's okay, anything is justified as long as I'm saving the people that are close to me or protecting the people that are close to me. That attitude really gets undermined when you start to think about who these other people are, what their lives are like. You get to know not just some of the wolves, you get to know some of the scars, you realize this is a tragic, you know, like escalation between, you know, they had a truce, things were going fine, and then, you know, one minor problem escalates into a larger one, into a larger one, until they're in this war. Both sides feel justified being in it. Both sides feel like the only possible good outcome is destruction of the other kind so that their people can live in peace. And you're like, but everyone on this in this story is a human being. Everyone has got a perspective that you can understand. Everybody, and, and Abby is sort of the ultimate example of that. Somebody like, you can understand her perspective, you've got this redemption arc for her that you're totally rooting for, and then you're trying to get revenge on her, and you get, take that all the way to the end where Ellie, traumatized, tra traumatized as she is by her nightmares, her memories of Joel, the fact that she feels like the only way to get, you know, any kind of peace out of this whole scenario is to you know is to just destroy everyone associated with it and she just feels driven to to resolve these these tortured and angry feelings by 
just killing one more person. She's killed so many people in her life, just killing this one more person. And while I'm playing as her, and I'm like, what, I have to hit the button to to punch her? I have to jam a button to drown this pl this character that I've played for, you know, a dozen hours and come to really love? No, I don't want to be doing this. I was, like, viscerally, you know, uh, uh, feeling this revulsion at what the game was making me do, just like I did when I was Joel and I was shooting the doctor. I was feeling the same way with Ellie. But that's the meaning of this game, is that, you know, when you're killing people in these stories, that matters. It means something. And you're destroying something that's unique and beautiful. And you can't just treat that as callously as you treat it in, in, in a typical video game. And, you know, that's on top of, you know, this is a game where you do actually kill, like, uh, over 100 people or something. So, you know, it's it's got its flaws. <laughs> but at the same time, you know... That story is something I wanted to be told. I needed to be told. Um, and so, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, the thing that I definitely did not want to see was Ellie, was Ellie taking, taking, successfully taking her revenge on Abby. And I've, I've heard that early on in, in, in the development of The Last of Us 2, that was the ending they had planned, was they were going to have Ellie kill Abby and suffer, you know, consequences for that and have it be a really dark choice that you as a player feel uncomfortable with and basically have an ending that was very similar to the last of us one which is you know the hero makes this dark choice and you're meant to feel uncomfortable about it and this time they didn't go for it and i think i kind of understand why and it has to do with the way that a lot of audience members reacted especially like when the spoilers were leaked and they didn't go through the experience themselves but were just told some of the facts um you know in 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 uh, about the story when people, when some people found out that Joel was going to be killed by a character they'd never met before, and that that character was going to survive at the end, uh, they reacted really negatively to that, re really viscerally. And to me, I love those kind, that kind of challenging storytelling just all the time. And so, like, I was totally on board, and I did not understand why people were having a problem with it. As I've thought about it more, I, I've started to think a little bit about why that might be the case. And you know, I can't speak for other people. I can't try to represent their perspective, especially when I disagree with them so emphatically. Um, and, and not just, you know, about their opinions. I really disagree with the practice of uh, harassing and sending death threats to the creators of a game that made you mad. Uh, even if you think your position is legitimate, don't ever do that. So just putting that out there. When your anger lets you get that far, uh, you've, you're wrong regardless of what your opinion is. But... That said, you know, I disagree, Just even if we just leave that aside. I disagree with these folks, but here's what I think might be going on. First off, game characters are commodities. You know, they're not just a character in a story. They are you, and they are a set of powers, and they're, they're things that you can do. Um, and, you know, they, they're, they're a collection of actions that you can perform that are yours. They're a character. They're, they're, they're a little model. They're a, they're a toy that you can run around. And... You, you sort of, and I'm, I'm, I'm minimizing it with this language a little bit, but it's a really legitimate, powerful feeling. What a lot of what makes our favorite games really compelling is the fact that we have this thing, we have this person that we can be and that we can control and that we can play, and that really matters to us. And so taking a character away from us, it's not just killing a character in a story. That it, it's, it's more than that. It's taking away something that we own and that we feel like is ours. It's like if somebody, you know, if you're actually, you know, out there playing with your action figures with your friends as a kid, and then your friend takes one of your action figures and breaks it in half and says, well, that's just part of the story we're telling. You're like, no, that was my toy. You broke my toy. And so I think there's a certain amount of reaction uh, to, to Joel's death that, that is that, where people who really, you know, thought of Joel as one of their things that they love to play with is, is taken away. That's taken away from them. I, I saw a similar reaction uh, I think from one of uh, from one of my followers uh, who had a really really negative reaction to um, Ellie losing her fingers at the end and, and being unable to play the guitar and presumably being unable to do a lot of the things that he does that she does in the game. It's really hard to fire a gun with missing fingers. It's really hard to you know rip someone up with a stiletto with missing fingers. Um, and so there's this presumption that Ellie is going to be a different character and Ellie's going to be a limited character um, with the loss of those fingers. And, and the reaction to that was, I, I think, is very much about that sense of, you know, you just broke the hand off my toy. Why did you do that? You broke my stuff. You, you're, you know, I'm not going to play with you anymore if you break my stuff. Um, so, so it's interesting to be telling a story like this. It's an interesting challenge for these developers to be telling a story like this, you know, which I think in a movie, you know, I think would be a lot more acceptable. But because 
you also run the risk of breaking the player's toys. Um, there's, you know, th there's a sense of ownership that people have over, the, over these characters, and they don't want you to just do whatever the story wants with something that they own, you know, that, that, that is theirs. That's part of it, I think, that, that sort of amps up the emotional energy that's, that's built up around this. Another thing, though, is I think it's really easy to get swept up in the mission of a video game character. You know, I think that a lot of people who were playing as Joel weren't necessarily having the reaction to his behavior that I was having. You know, I was having this reaction of like, I was judging everything he was doing. And I was like, hey, no, no, don't kill that. I don't want to kill that. I don't want to pull the trigger on that doctor. I don't want to kill that doctor. I understand that doctor is killing someone that I care about, but I understand why he's doing it. And I don't think that he just needs to be shot in the face for it. Like, gah, you know? Um... But I think not everyone was doing that. I think a lot of people, when they're playing video games, they get immersed in the character and what the character's doing. And, and you know, they see the mission objectives for the character, and they act out what the character does, and they get very involved in the character's point of view, and they accept the character's point of view. So I think a lot of people ended The Last of Us 1 not feeling this kind of twisted sense of like, uh, Joel, eh, I don't know if I'm happy being you anymore. You know, I don't know if they ended the game like that. I think a lot of people ended the game being like, yeah, wow, Joel beat all those people. Joel won. Awesome. You know, and, you know, Ellie's a little uncomfortable with what I did, but, you know, she doesn't know what I did, and I'm keeping it under wraps. You know, it's like, but I am Joel, the cowboy, who, you know, wears a white hat, and he gallivant gallivants through the frontier, and he's taking out the bad guys, and he's doing what he has to do, and he's making the hard choices, and I feel good about Joel. And if that's the way that The Last of Us 1 ended for you, then I can imagine Joel being punished for that, destroyed, taken away from you because of what he did, doesn't feel good. Um, and that's, you know, that's, again, you know, one of the challenges in, in, in a game like this is that they're trying to tell a story about how the protagonist is doing bad things and how you, as a player, playing as a protagonist, are doing bad things. And they want you to sort of, like, have regret for what you, for, for the choices that you made. I don't think they want you to look at Ellie's ending and think, oh yeah, she did great. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, I, you know, the fact that she could not, you know, stay with Dina, the fact that she had to go to California and keep hunting Abby, even after she had seen so much of, of the darkness of that path, the fact that she had to go back that's a weakness in her character. That's a thing she's doing that is wrong. And, you know, but if you're caught up in Ellie's story, that same way, you're just like, yeah, go get her, you know? And, and you sort of are on her side and you're, you know, and you see the mission objectives are to go and, and kill Abby. And you're just like, yeah, that's what I'm here to do. And if, if that's the experience you're having, then if they had ended it with you succeeding in killing Abby, I think a lot of people would be like, yeah, we got her finally, you know? And... That and they would have thought, you know, basically had the same reaction to the end of The Last of Us 2 that they had to the end of The Last of Us 1, which was not getting the message that the writers intended. And so I think the reason why they had Ellie actually learn from Abby, watch Abby cut her own revenge short multiple times, spare Ellie on purpose, refuse to fight, you know, seeing that she went from being consumed with the need for vengeance against Joel, but then didn't let that consume the rest of her life learned from from her mistakes learned from from you know seeing the reactions of mel and owen seeing you know the way that people you know judged yara and lev and uh you know and how they were you know they were perfectly good people that her own people were treating as monsters she she her perspective broadened she made much better choices because of that and then ellie learns that from her and decides not to kill her and that is ellie's ending is one where you know she bears consequences for the bad choices that she made she loses her fingers you know and she you know she loses um you know her 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 the love of her life she you know loses everything she cared about but then at the very last minute makes the choice that that, that the you know that the story is telling you is the right choice which is you know You've got to stop this cycle somewhere. At some point, you have to start imagining the other people around you, even the people you hate, even the people who have wronged you. You have to start imagining them as other human beings. And while sometimes you have to make pragmatic choices when your life is in danger, you know, you should not be the one who is making this cycle of violence happen. You should not be the one who is bringing this to other people, who is bringing this destruction and this death to the world. You need to be one of the people who is, you know, trying to get to Catalina to try to build something better. You know, it's like, that's that's who you should be. 
So I think their decision to not end on the dark note this time, but instead to end on a barely visible beacon of hope. <laughs> you know, like, and, and that is one of my favorite things. One of my favorite movies is Children of Men, for instance. And I think that one of the reasons I love Children of Men is because they challenge themselves to make you feel hope with under the maximum amount of despair. There's like, humanity is dying out. There's next to no hope. There's one baby that you know about in the entire world. And they try to make you feel hope under the most impossible circumstances. And I love that about that movie. And and this game is doing a very similar thing. It brings Ellie to an extremely dark place. and But still, at the very end, they make you feel like Goomer of Hope. And they don't go with the dark ending that a lot of people would just misinterpret and just basically be like, yeah, I'm along for the ride with Joel. I'm along for the ride with Ellie. Revenge is great. I'm on board. Let's have more murder. You know, it's like, that's the reaction I think they got from a lot of their audience. And I think they decided to try to make it clearer what they were going for. That, you know, Abby is the redemption arc. Abby is the real story. She is the person that represents what they're saying people should do. You might start in a dark place, you might start with people having wronged, you might start desperate for revenge, but you have to get to a place where you're turning it around and changing your mind and uh, and abandoning that 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 attitude, that perspective on the world and instead trying to save people, you know, trying to save what you love. Um so Anyway, so so that's how I kind of view a lot of this uh, this 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 controversy is that you know I think that the Last of Us has always been about this. It's always been about this idea, and the Last of Us two, you know, basically took that ambiguous ending of the Last of Us one that was dark and ugly and easy to sort of take a bunch of different ways, and they basically said, okay, let's that one moment, that one moment that was just extremely problematic when you shot that doctor. Let's just run back and forth across that moment for an entire game and help you understand why this hurts, why this hurts the world, why it hurts your soul, what is wrong with this moment, and let's just go back and forth about it until we all understand what this is about. And their single-mindedness, uh, you know, by like pursuing that theme and that experience, and how much that theme matters to me and how much I love it, uh, just really was what added up to, to me feeling like this is one of my favorite games of all time. So, anyway... I actually, I've had, you know, at least one of my, uh, oh, hey, awesome Twitch dude just showed up in my chat. He's the one who's been asking me for this video this entire time, wanting to hear my review of The Last of Us 2. So uh, I think he's missed most of it, but I hope he'll check it out on YouTube later on, uh, because that's sort of the sum total of my thoughts on, on The Last of Us 2. There's a lot of other, I mean, if we actually sat down and played this game together, there are lots of things I could point out, uh, you know, about the combat, about the resource management, about the exploration, about the fact that this is one of the few games I've ever played where I actually read every single one of the notes that are left lying around. Because the world, like, I actually really want to understand this world and its people to a degree that I don't in most games. Usually the background of a game and all of its lore is just, like, whatever, I'm just here for the gameplay. But in this game, I want to read every single thing because, you know, I, I really care about the, this world and the, creators that, uh, the, the characters that they've created. And... That's rare for me, you know, and so there's so many things about this game that I could talk about if we went through it piece by piece, but what they're doing with the story, I mean, that really is the heart of the game. That's the kind of game that uh, Naughty Dog is making here, is is a game that's about this story, and so that's really the heart of what I care about. So um, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna wrap up this video, and then I'm going to go and, uh, and, and sort of uh, spend some time rereading back through the chat and, and seeing what folks have said, because I'm sure there's a lot of great points that have been made by the folks that are watching this, and I just... You know, I took a bunch of notes on this. I don't even have notes when I'm making videos usually, but uh, but I really wanted to get through my thoughts on this because I, I don't know. I feel like one of the reasons why my game, uh, you know, State of Decay, which you know, I, I I joined the State of Decay team right after the original game came out. I don't get any credit for the original game, but it came out basically the same week as The Last of Us 1. And the only reason that State of Decay was able to survive was because it was such a different game from The Last of Us. The Last of Us was a game that was mostly about story, characters, this, you know, the the, the themes that they were sort of uh, uh, drilling into your head <laughs> through the gameplay. Um, it was about that. It was about this, this you know, cinematic story experience that you're having. Whereas our game was much more about sort of the, the gameplay, the mechanics of survival in the, uh, in, in the, in the post-apocalypse, in the zombie apocalypse um and so because our games are so different that's what made our game possible to survive because if they had leaned into 
the mechanics of surviving the zombie apocalypse, uh, we probably would have been just demolished. <laughs> but but because our games are so different, uh, we're able to work. And and normally the kind of game that I play is my kind of game. It's it, 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 it state of decay. Like that's that's what I spend most of my time devoted to. Is these very um, mechanics driven. Uh, simulation driven uh you know t- types of experiences um and so the last of us 2 is not the kind of game i'm usually super into and th- the thing that i love about it is how you know they've made something that is so special and so powerful that it breaks through my usual preferences and and, and, and it becomes one of my favorite games ever despite the fact that it doesn't line up with like it, the, my entire list of favorite games includes a bunch of games that are extremely different from the last of us and the last of us <laughs> so anyway so I really wanted to get at my thoughts on this because uh, th- this game is, is just so phenomenal and it stands out as this unique beacon uh, amongst the rest of the industry. So uh, I will wrap this video up with that um, and then we'll move on to do some other things, including reading back in the chat and, uh, and seeing what I missed.